It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, good, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This government has so many backroom deals with their insiders that it's, it's actually hard to keep track. Just a few years ago, this government was once again embroiled in a scandal where they attempted to pass a law to accredit a private evangelic university, a school known for being Islamophobic, homophobic, transphobic, a school run by a very close friend of the Premier, Charles McVitie. At the time, the government claimed the process was all up to code, and now they're subject to a lawsuit. Speaker, does the Premier believe the process of accreditation for the school was free from interference? Mr. Colleges and Universities, to Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Court of Appeal dismissed uh, Canada Christian College's appeal, and the Ministry is pleased with the Court's decision, and there's no further comment on the situation or matter at this time. The supplementary question. Um, the then Minister of Colleges and Universities said the process and their actions were, and I want to quote him here, the most transparent thing that could exist. Now, a leaked recording of a phone call between McVitie and that same minister found the minister was working overtime to help McVitie get his school accredited, even asking him to make the submission, and I quote again, as easy as possible for me to sign off on no matter what. Speaker, back to the Premier. Is the Premier concerned about the ongoing pattern of preferential treatment his friends are receiving? Reply the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, the Ministry is pleased with the Court's decision and has no further comment on the matter. I will comment, though, PCAB submitted their report and the Minister of the Day accepted that report of the recommendations to. Um, for the university to not receive, for the college to not receive their university status. But this government will stand up against all forms of hate and ensure that all students are, feel safe on their campuses. The final supplementary. I think the government appreciates just how bad all this looks. Backroom deals in land use planning, the Greenbelt grab, MZOs, private health care, and even universities now. And I have another quote for you. Uh, speaker, because weeks after that recorded phone call, that minister told this House, we cannot interfere with these types of procedural safeguards. It's wrong. It violates the principles of fundamental justice. But privately, he was telling McVitie something very different. And I'm going to quote again. We're going to guide this process through, he said. And we are going to make sure you got to where you wanted to go and right where you want it to get. Wow. <laughs> so back to the Premier. Why was your government saying one thing to the people and a different thing behind closed Questions. doors? Mr. Colleges and Universities. And I said this government will stand up against all forms of hate and ensure that all students feel safe on campuses across this province. PCAB submitted their report and the recommendation to not uh, give the university status to the college, and the Court of Appeal dismissed Canada Christian College's appeal, and we are just no further comment on the matter at this time. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, let's talk more about this government's shady deals and doublespeak, this time about urban boundary changes. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the parliamentary comment. This time we're going to talk about urban boundary changes. To the Premier, two weeks ago the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was asked whether he would reverse the forced expansion of Hamilton's urban boundaries. He said, and I quote, no, Mr. Speaker, I will not reverse the expansion of the urban boundaries. But just two weeks later, the Minister suddenly reversed course. So to the Premier. What spooked his minister so much that he would completely reverse a position he was doubling down on just two weeks ago? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And a week ago, the Leader of the Opposition wasn't going to force the member for Auto Hamilton Centre out of the party, and in the same week she flip-flopped three or four times. You know what changed, Mr. Speaker? Very sincerely, I had a, a long discussion with Mayor Sutcliffe in Ottawa. 
Uh, he explained to me what Ottawa would like to accomplish with respect to their housing targets. I did the same uh, with other mayors. Uh, I had a very good conversation uh, uh, with uh, the former leader of the NDP, who is now the mayor in, in Hamilton. Uh, and they are all on the same page with wanting to ensure that we build 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario and to work with us to get that happen. So I made the decision, Mr. Speaker, to, to better work with our municipal partners and to build on the successes that we've already had in bringing housing supply action plans to this House, Mr. Speaker. That's what the change was. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it was never about land. It was never about housing. You didn't need that land. And it wasn't just two weeks ago, Speaker, it was as recent as last week. Because last week we asked the minister about this government's overuse of ministerial zoning orders to give preferential treatment to their favoured speculators. And once again, the minister doubled down and defended his government's abuse of MZOs. Now he's reviewing them. Back to the Premier. Why does it take an RCMP investigation for this government to understand why preferential treatment is wrong? Well, take and I remind members to make their comments through the chair, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Good luck, Mr. Speaker. I can get up here and again identify all of the MZOs that are uh, allowed for housing to be built in the members' own community. Housing requests, MZO requests that we got from the City of Toronto, requests that we got. Uh, from uh, other municipal partners, the requests that we got from, uh, from the Minister of Health so that we could build hospitals, requests that were submitted uh, by the Minister of Long-Term Care to build long-term care, Mr. Speaker. What I am reviewing are those MZOs that were given for the purpose of building housing that, at this point, have not started. As I've said in my first press, co press conference, I want to move to a system of use it or lose it. There is no benefit for the people of the province of Ontario for our home building partners to be sitting on allocations uh, if they're not going to use it. And that's what I am reviewing, Mr. Speaker, because the primary goal of the MZOs has been to move development ahead, whether it's for schools, long-term care, hospitals, and supportive housing to the tomb of thousands of homes in the members' own community, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, it's their friends, but it's Ontarians' money. Today, the CBC reported that certain amendments to Hamilton's official plan were written word for word by a well-connected developer and Conservative donor, Sergio Mancha. The very same Sergio Mancha who received preferential treatment in the Greenbelt grab. The very same speculator who bought tickets to the now infamous Stag and Doe from the head of the Conservatives' fundraising team. The Integrity Commissioner's report has evidence. The Premier repeatedly called Mr. Mancha prior to the changes to the Greenbelt and Hamilton's official plan. Speaker, back to the Premier. In any of those phone calls, did the Premier Question. discuss changes to Hamilton's official plan with Mr. Mancha? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, let, let me explain to the, the Leader of the Opposition some of the things that happen when you are, when you are working sure. both as a government and, and as a member of parliament. So, in advance of official plans, I can say that in my office, I had community leaders tell me what they wanted to see happen. I had mayors call me saying what they wanted to see happen. I even had home builders making suggestions uh, uh, to me. But ultimately, Mr. Speaker, what we should be guided by is the provincial planning statement. The reason I made the decisions to reverse some Order. of those uh, 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 changes to uh, official plans is because I didn't feel that they met the spirit. Uh, that is important to bring public trust with you. Now, I know the Leader of the Opposition Order. is humming and hollering. She asks a question. She doesn't want to hear the answer to you. You know why, colleagues? Because for her, it's the same old thing. Roadblocks and get in the way, right? That's all they're about. Stand in the way of development. Stand in the way of progress. They're a radical small group of people who don't understand what it takes to move the province forward, and that is why they continuously lose. <laughs> Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Uh, this Order. morning, Order. CBC Hamilton. Leader of the opposition will come to order. The gov uh, government house leader, Minister of Municipal Affairs, will come to order.
The Minister of Municipal Affairs will come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. The rest of you will all come to order. Member for Hamilton West, Ann Castor Dundas has the floor. To the Premier, this morning CBC Hamilton confirmed that the government's changes to Hamilton's official plan came directly from speculators connected to the Premier. The City of Hamilton rejected the original application for development because it contradicted Hamilton's zoning rules and faced public opposition. Instead of listening to City Council and local residents, the government's decisions came word for word from speculator Sergio Mancha and lobbyist Matt Johnson to allow an eight-story building on a designated heritage site. So, Premier, are ministers in your cabinet taking directions from speculators? Once again, remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, I, I know who I take uh, my direction from, the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That's where I take my direction from. And when I hear parents tell me that they have kids who have made 21 offers on homes and are not even in the game, I know I have to double down and do even more. And you know who else knows that? All of the progressive conservatives who are sitting in this chamber. We are completely focused on one thing, making life more affordable Porter. for people of the province of Ontario, building 1.5 million homes so that the next generation of Ontario families can have the exact same dream that almost every Every one of us in this chamber have, Mr. Speaker. That's the dream of home ownership. It is why millions of people have chosen to come to the province of Ontario in her own community, Mr. Speaker. So, to the member opposite, I say very, very clearly: we will not stop working on behalf of the people of this province. We will not stop building a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario, even if that means Spons? rolling over the radical NDP who simply say no to everything, Mr. Speaker. If it was up to them, we'd be back in 1933, and we. Won't let that order. The supplementary question. People of Hamilton wish you would just stop taking direction from speculators. That's what we wish in Hamilton. And these are not just any speculators that the Premier took direction from, but the exact people who were at his daughter's stag and doe. They're the same people interviewed by officers of the legislature because of preferential treatment in the Greenbelt grab. Ancaster Councillor Craig Kassar said it best. It is entirely undemocratic for the province to accommodate for-profit interests that are in complete contradiction to the public interest. So, how many changes to official plans came directly, word for word, from speculators? Member for Prince H.I.C. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, I, I think that the valuable part of that question was profit, right? And here is the crux of everything the NDP. They don't want a system where people can get ahead in this province, right? Anything that is about helping people advance, they're going to be against. Mr. Speaker, so what are we doing? We're building more homes for people and we're removing obstacles so that we can get more homes built for people in the province of Ontario. We're cutting taxes so that the lowest income earners don't have to pay taxes to the government. Imagine that. They voted against it. I'm building long-term care homes because, as the Minister of Long-Term Care says, we owe a responsibility to those who help build this province, Mr. Speaker. They're against that. Later on today, we will be bringing a motion forward. The member for Stormont or for uh, Chatham Kent Essex, he will be bringing a motion forward to call on the federal government to remove the, the carbon tax from fuel. And Response. we will, are hoping, we are hoping the NDP will do the right thing and vote with us to put more money back in the people's pockets. I bet, Mr. Speaker, they won't, and they'll continue on a destructive path. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The policies of the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, saw our tech sector stagnate. Our brightest tech workers were leaving the province, and game-changing tech innovations were occurring abroad. Thankfully, our government took office and immediately reversed the Liberals' anti-business policies. Now Ontario is home to one of the fastest growing tech hubs in the world. Our critical technology initiatives is one of the measures we are implementing to remain a global tech leader. Speaker, can the minister please speak to the importance of our critical technology initiatives and some of the projects it has supported? 
and to respond, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The government is making strategic investments to ensure that Ontario is at the forefront of global tech innovation through our $107 million critical technology initiative. We're accelerating the development, commercialization and use of important uh, technologies like cybersecurity and AI. This includes a $5 million investment we made to support CCTX's Ontario Cybersecurity Excellence Initiative. This will help companies across the province develop and adopt cybersecurity technologies, help them to become more competitive, grow, and create good paying jobs. Speaker, we are making sure Ontario is a global leader in tech innovation and ensuring that businesses have access to the technologies Spons. they need to remain competitive. Here, here. Supplementary question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answer. It's great to hear about the important investments we're making through our critical technology initiatives. We know these critical technologies present massive economic op opportunities for Ontario. AI, 5G, and quantum technologies are expected to contribute $29 trillion to the global economy by 2035. By supporting technological innovation, we can help more companies across the critical technologies access the critical technologies they need to become more competitive. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on other investments recently made by our government through critical technology initiatives? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, critical technologies fuel innovation. They drive growth in every sector, and that's why our government invested $50 million into the Ontario Centre of Innovation for their new program to help businesses adopt these critical technologies. It will focus on helping businesses in mining, agri-food and advanced manufacturing so that they too can increase their competitiveness and boost their productivity. That's in addition to the $27 million we invested in the Vector Institute as they make it easier for companies to develop AI applications for safe and ethical AI right here in Ontario. You know, the Premier reminds me every day we have 414 thousand tech workers here in the province of Ontario because we're building this world-class ecosystem to make sure that those technologies are developed right here in Ontario. Next question, the member from Mishkiga, Walk, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. At a time this uh, province was building off-market buildings, These were houses that were built according to the needs and not for profit. The government stopped in 1995, yes, when the Conservatives decided to um, reject that responsibility. And that led to the housing crisis today. To the Prime Minister, to the Premier, will he support the NDP's solution to provide off market housing that we so desperately need? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, so in fairness, I did take a look at uh, the NDP plan that they uh, that they provided uh, yesterday. It's very similar to a plan that was uh, brought forward by uh, Bob Ray between 1990 and 95. Now, the hallmark of that plan, Mr. Speaker, the, the hallmark of that plan, Mr. Speaker, was that they suggested one price and then it came in hundreds of millions of dollars over budget. And what they thought would happen didn't happen. It didn't provide the housing that was required, Mr. Speaker. What then ended Order. up happening was that the government had to go out and spend money on buying land, awesome. Speaker, so housing wasn't built. So the program was cancelled because it wasn't coming through for the people of the province of Ontario and because the previous NDP government literally bankrupted the province of Ontario. Now, to put it in context, they left the province of Ontario back in 1995 with an $11 billion deficit in 1995. What's that, the equivalent of $25 billion in today's, uh, in today's economy, Mr. Speaker? And what did they accomplish? Well, they actually outpaced the Liberals. They accomplished even less than zero. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
maybe the minister should go see in the parks and see how there's uh, tent villages. Uh, we see them even in northern Ontario that we didn't see uh, beforehand. I think he's uh, disconnected from reality. Mr. Speaker, uh, at the same level uh, uh, in importance as health, education, and uh, pension plans, if, a pri if the private sector can't build enough uh, affordable housing for all those that need it, the public sector can has to then take up this effort. Uh, us on this side of the house, we'd like to ensure that every Ontarian has a, a house and a roof over their heads, a housing that they can pay for without having to make choices about whether they can uh, provide for their family. When will this government take housing seriously? Speaker, look, we brought in a series of bills in this place since 2018 that the member opposite has literally voted against every single one of them. He talks about he talks about in his answer some of the issues with surrounding mental health and addictions. Order. And he has voted against the roadmap to wellness. He's talking about jobs and opportunity, yet he and his colleague from Sudbury voted against mines and more opportunity for people. Their plan is predicated on the fact that somehow there is a secret cache of bureaucrats somewhere who are going to go out and start building homes for the people of the province of Ontario. If they're there, then I will unleash them, but I have not found the secret cache of people. Order. Because you know who will build social housing? It is the same people that build rental housing. It is the same people that build the homes that all of us live in, Mr. Speaker. And what we have done, they say they want to take Spons? the profit out of it but they want to add a tax to it. Because when we took away development charges on purpose-built rentals, on, on the HST, when we said no development charges on social housing, they voted against it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Speaker, Ontario's mining sector has never been more important than it is today. Our province depends significantly on our resource sector, which impacts every part of our daily lives, from the cars that we drive to the phones that we carry in our pockets. Mining is also responsible for creating, creating the economy of the future, and it is a source of job opportunities in the North and throughout Ontario. Sadly, the opposition NDP and Liberals continue to say no to opportunities that will help maintain Ontario's position as a world leader in sustainable mining. That is why our government must continue to act with urgency in supporting this vital sector. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is strengthening Ontario's mining sector? Thank you. The Minister of Mines. Thank you to the member from Brantford Brant for the question. Thanks to our government, the opportunities for the Ontario mining industry have never been better than they are right now. This is the result of our plan to make Ontario the leading mining jurisdiction in Canada. We have made strategic investments like the $35 million in the Ontario Junior Exploration Program and $5 million in the Ontario and the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund. We have passed the Building More Mines Act to cut through red tape to ensure that government operates at the pace of business. Here, here. Speaker, the response from industry has been overwhelmingly positive, and we are just getting started. Even though we all know how important mining is for the economy, the NDP voted no to every investment and every red tape in initiative we have done to support this sector. It's a shameful record, Speaker. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I know from speaking to the minister that the mining sector supports 75,000 jobs across our great province and contributes over $13 billion to our GDP every single year. Yet the NDP continues to vote against every investment made by our government that helps to strengthen this sector. It's unfortunate that the NDP and the Liberals continue to promote narratives that incite fear and mistrust of Ontario's mining industry. In contrast, our government must support mining and the many benefits it provides to Northern and Indigenous communities and our province as a whole. 
Most importantly, we must show respect to the hard-working and dedicated miners who are reshaping our economy and advancing electric vehicle production. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the role of the mining sector in building a stronger Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Mine. For this question, mining provided a career and life for many people in my hometown of South Porcupine. And as our government and this premier that is creating more opportunities for mining, we are ensuring everyone in Ontario will benefit from this generational opportunity to fuel the future. We know we can't do this without strong industry partners like the Ontario Mining Association. I invite all members to join the Meet the Miners reception with the OMA at 5 p.m. today at the Sheraton Hotel. Nice. I encourage everyone, including the opposition, to come and learn about the, the sector, and they have, which is a sector they clearly have lost faith in. The future of economy is evolving right now, but none of it can happen without mining. Everyone needs vote to to vote yes to mining. Here, here. Yes. To Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you to the Premier. This afternoon, this vulnerable persons in support of Living Accommodation Act. And once again, I want to thank uh, Welland City Councillor Bonnie Fokins and Carolyn Fast for being here today. If passed, it will provide a regulatory framework requiring all supportive living home operators to be licensed and allow for inspection and complaint protocols. The Toronto Star's investigation into unregulated supportive living homes revealed gut-wrenching conditions. Yep. Speaker, in just one home, they found rats, mold, bed bugs, and soiled mattresses, and there have been deaths due to fire. Will this government support this legislation? Great question. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And I want to thank my, uh, my colleague for the question. Speaker, I want to be very clear. We expect everyone to uphold public health and property standards, especially when it comes to housing most vulnerable in our communities, Mr. Speaker. All landlords and housing providers have a legal responsibility to provide safe and habitable homes to their tenants. That's the law, Mr. Speaker. We're tackling the issue from both sides. My colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, is creating more opportunities for at-risk people to receive the critical supports they need, and our government has made two of the largest increases to ODSP programs in the program's history, Mr. Speaker, putting more money Order. in ODSP recipient. This year, Mr. Order. Speaker, we're investing $2.1 billion to fund accommodation that meets the needs of adults with developmental Order. disabilities. Mr. Speaker, that's an increase of Spons. nearly a half a billion dollars since 2018 when we formed government. Mr. Speaker, it's prepared. Thank you. The minister will take his seat. Thank you. Member for Toronto St. Paul's come to order. Supplementary question. Speaker, that's a little comfort to vulnerable persons. My private member's bill will set minimum standards so that vulnerable tenants no longer suffer from dangerous and sometimes life threatening situations. Following the death of a tenant in London, an unregulated supportive living home, the city acted quickly to put bylaws in place, but mi municipalities want provincial regulations. Sure. Will this government listen to its municipal partners, pass my bill, and bring it back from committee as quickly as possible before we see more deaths of vulnerable persons in Ontario's supportive living accommodations? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to providing supports, as I mentioned this year, the, the, for the developmental sector alone, we're investing nearly three quarters of a billion dollars more than we did when we formed government. On support of housing, $2.1 billion are being to invest. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House and in the middle across, we have put initiatives forward to make sure that we protect Ontarians, especially on most vulnerable. And Mr. Speaker, we will stop at nothing to hold Order. those accountable who do not protect people of this province, especially our most vulnerable. The only problem is, Mr. Speaker, every single Order. initiative that we put forward to provide supports for the people of Ontario, the opposition votes against. They'll come here and ask for things, but when we put bills forward that support Ontarians, especially our most vulnerable, the NDP constantly Order. supports Okay, stop the clock. 
The member for Toronto St. Paul's will rise and withdraw her unparliamentary comment. Withdraw. Thank you. Order. 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 We're ready to start again. Start the clock. Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Long Term Care. Nearly two years ago, there was cause for optimism for long term care in Haldeman Norfolk, with 334 new beds and 324 upgrades announced. Two years later, and ground has not been broken at any of the six facilities where beds or improvements were announced. Speaker, when will the members opposite admit the environment to build does not exist here in Ontario? And I'm told construction costs have, been, have risen to the point all these projects may be in jeopardy. All the while, wait, time, wait times continue to grow and are abysmal, with most families waiting over a year for a bed. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the ministry doing to ensure these announcements from two years ago will actually go ahead, and when is the plan to expedite construction? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. A lot to update this House on on long-term care, which we've been doing uh, for the past, well, several years, to be frank. A $10 billion capital plan with a plan to build and redevelop 58,000 and they're not bad, they're homes uh, in this province for our amazing seniors. In fact, Speaker, uh, the member does mention something very important, which is that construction costs have escalated. That's why we introduced the construction funding, funding subsidy under the leadership of our last uh, Minister of Long-Term Care, which has led to the approval of 11,000 beds for construction in this province. Uh, speaker, the, the member sits next to the independent Liberals who built 611 net new beds for the better part of a decade. I'm proud to update this House that under this Premier's leadership, since 2018, we have completed or are under construction 18,000 beds in this great province. More work to be done, but we're on track. We're going to take care of our seniors in Ontario. The supplementary question. Here. While the minister talks sunshine and rainbows for other parts of the province, that does not help my seniors in Haldeman Norfolk. Approvals in supporting projects elsewhere is not actually getting the beds built in Haldeman Norfolk. Dover Cliffs, a retirement home in Port Dover, was one of the projects announced for expansion. But those plans have been paused after the project went to tender this spring. From announcement to tender, it's been four years. I call that a snail's pace. Dover Cliffs is a Class C facility. B and C class licenses will expire at the end of June in 2025. Where will those 70 residents at Dover Cliffs go? There are actually 26,531 licenses set to expire in two years, according to the Financial Account Accountability Office. And yet, again, here this morning, we don't see a plan to get shovels in the ground. Speaker, Question. can the minister assure seniors of Haldeman and Norfolk there will be a bed for them close to home in 2025, or will he relocate them halfway across the province? Minister of Long-Term Care. So, Speaker, uh, on well, I kind of went through the update on the first answer, uh, mentioning that we've got shovels in the ground or have built 18,000 beds well on the way to complete that 58,000. Uh, but the member is correct. I mean, uh, there are more beds to be constructed. In fact, we've got uh, members from, from our government coming up to me with projects in their neighbourhood. We've got members of the NDP coming up to me with projects in their neighbourhood. The member chooses a peculiar way of lobbying for her riding. Um, we acknowledge that seniors need more homes. It is this government that has taken it upon themselves to actually build that capacity and staff with the health human resources. So I encourage the member, perhaps instead of standing in question period uh, and, and saying, oh, well, the, the, the neighbourhood needs this and that, well, come to me and show that information to me, and let's work on that, because this government has proven, under the leadership Order. of this Premier, that we are building those very beds in this province. Spons. Speaker, after a decade of neglect under the people who sit next to her, this government Order. has taken it upon themselves to take care of our seniors. They took care of us. Order. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. The previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, ignored the housing crisis that was developing across our province. 
There are currently hundreds of thousands of individuals and families struggling to find a home that meets their needs. Also, the lack of transit infrastructure creates barriers to accessing convenient transit services. Our government put forward the solution of developing transit-oriented communities to increase housing supply. This is a positive step forward and shows that our government understands that housing is one of the most important infrastructure issues facing our communities. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain how transit-oriented communities are helping to build a stronger Ontario? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for asking the question, Mr. Speaker. Our government has made a commitment to build more homes in the province of Ontario. And one of the ways that we intend on reaching that target is through our transit-oriented communities program. Mr. Speaker, we have a once-in-a-generation once opportunity. We're expanding the subway system by 50 per cent in the City of Toronto and in York Region. And that's why we're no longer building station boxes, but rather communities around the stations. Mr. Speaker, Exhibition, King and Bathurst, Queen's Pedina, Corktown, East Harbour, Bridge and High Tech are already underway. And last week, we announced that we're sharing information with the City of Toronto, working collaboratively with them on six new complete communities. Eastern, Gerard, Carla, South, Pape, Cosburn, Thorncliffe, Lawrence will all be new transit communities that people Response. can live in the future. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it is clear from the minister's answer that our government is committed to increasing housing options and making access to transit infrastructure more convenient. There are many economic, social, and environmental benefits that come from the increasing housing supply and bringing housing closer to transit stations. Our government has made excellent progress to expand transit networks, but we must remain focused on solutions that will provide even more transit options. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is addressing Ontario's growing transit infrastructure needs? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member. Mr. Speaker, this, these six proposed TOCs would create approximately 5,900 new residential units in the City of Toronto, including affordable housing units, as well as 1,900 jobs, all or within walking distance of a transit station. Mr. Speaker, we are building complete communities that will have housing, jobs, and community amenities close to transit. By building complete communities, we are making life more convenient and affordable for the hardworking people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. The residents watching from the gallery today are from No Dem Evictions Toronto. They represent tens of thousands of tenants whose lives will be thrown into chaos when their homes are demolished to make way for new luxury condominiums. One tenant told my office how they're considering applying for MAID, medical assistance in dying, because of the hopelessness that they feel about, their losing, about losing their home when it has been enabled by the Premier's housing legislation. Speaker, will the Premier give the tenants hope today and commit to a moratorium on dem evictions in large rent-controlled buildings? Right on. Right on. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, uh, since we came into office in 2018, we have been focused on building homes for people, and that has included, of course, rental housing. One of the things that we saw, which was the hallmark of the previous Liberal and NDP coalition in this province, was that rental housing starts literally collapsed across the province of Ontario. So what we are seeing, of course, is that uh, rental housing starts in the province of Ontario under our government are at a 30-year high. And the good news on that, Mr. Speaker, is that in the first half of 2023, that pace has increased by over 44%. One of our biggest challenges in Toronto and across the province has been the supply of rental housing, Mr. Speaker, and we are tackling that head-on. At the same time, we are making significant investments in the landlord-tenant board to ensure that we can get to uh, 
uh, cases much more quickly. And I thank the Attorney General for that. We have introduced a number of pieces of legislation to better protect uh, uh, tenants across the province of Ontario, but ultimately we have to increase that supply so that there are more options for all Ontarians. Supplementary question, back to the member for Toronto Centre. Speaker, vulnerable tenants are contemplating suicide rather than facing eviction and demolition. Shame. Terry lives in a 250-unit building in my riding, which is slated for demolition. She's 92 years old. She's in the gallery today. She shares with me, I want to die. I live here alone. I am widowed. I'm not even looking for another place. Terry's story is not singular. Thousands of families are facing eviction from large, good rent control buildings. This question is from Terry to the Premier. Will, you use, will he use his extraordinary powers today to help Terry and hundreds of her neighbours by stopping the demolition of their home? Right on. Mr. Speaker, I have actually the used, we've used our extraordinary powers, quote unquote, uh, from the member opposite, to use ministerial zoning orders to build thousands of supportive housing units across across the city of Toronto, including in the member's own riding. Now, I say very clearly to the member opposite, she is against that. In Order. fact, at the start of question period Order. today, her, her leader literally Order. asked question after question after question, telling me that I should not do that. Order. So I say to the member opposite, I will continue Official opposition to use come to order. zoning orders when it helps build housing for the people of the province of Ontario. Official opposition will come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs has the floor. It really, it hurts them when their own radical ideas are put back yeah. in their face. Member for Mr. Ottawa Speaker. Center, we come have to order. Member, the, member, the Minister of Long-Term Care talked about 58,000 new homes for seniors. We've brought MZOs to build supportive housing in the City of Toronto. They voted against it. We've brought protections for landlords and tenants. They voted against everyone. Member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The next question. Okay, member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The member for Kitchener Centre will come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre is warned. The government side will come to order. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Gilwood, Scarborough Gilwood. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The residents of Scarborough Guildwood and across Ontario are struggling, and under his government, rent has never been higher. The average new listing for rental apartment in Toronto is almost $4,000 a month, or 60% of the household income of my riding. This government has had five years to address the housing crisis, but what do they have to show for it? One RCMP Order. criminal investigation. Does the minister think it is past time for his government to bring back rent control, or will they keep showing that they don't care for the renters of Ontario? Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, unfortunately for the member for Scarborough Guildwood. I happen to know the riding very, very well, having grown up there and gone to high school at Pope John Paul, just in that riding, Mr. Speaker. And you know what the problem is in that riding? 15 years of Liberal inaction when they had the opportunity to do something. So I know the member, I know the member is new to the House, but I would suggest the mem to the member opposite, Order. if she wants to find out why there are no homes being built in her riding, she should ask the leader of her party. If she wants to find out why there are no new long-term care homes under the 15 years, she should ask the person in front of her. Why it's this government that has to bring in new universities and medical schools to her riding because of this government. We build bridges the right way, they build them upside down. They didn't get transit and transportation did, we got it done. So if you want to know why your community is suffering, it is because for 15 years, Liberals supported by NDP did nothing for Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, and despite that, we're getting the job done for them. Stop the clock. Order. 
order. Order. The House will come to order so that we can resume question period. Restart the clock. Supplementary, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, every day I hear this government blaming everybody for just about any problem. But instead of addressing the issues, they have only gotten worse. But he has only recently been appointed Minister of Housing. He has the opportunity to right his government's wrongs. He has already backtracked on the previous minister's decision to expand urban boundaries and develop farmland. And he's already backtracked on developing the Green Belt after it came out that his government gifted their developer friend, friends $8.3 billion in prime real estate. Now through you, Mr. Speaker, I want again ask if the minister intends to backtrack again and restore of universal rent control that his government got rid of in 2018. The Premier. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just very, very similar to the minister, I've spent years and years in Scarborough Guildwood. We have a lot of friends there, but I'll, I'll tell the new Order. member, I'll tell the new Order. member why don't you ask your colleagues why they voted against a hospital that's been overdue for decades? Why don't you ask your members why they Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the Premier to pause for a second. I can't hear the Premier because of the noise in the House. And it's not an issue with the volume of his voice. It's the heckling that's going on. So come to order. We start the clock. The Premier has the floor. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Just, just to remind the member again, voting against hospitals, voting against subways, that you had the opportunity for 15 years. You totally ignored Scarborough, the forgotten city, until we came into power. You forgot to mention extended care that, that was built, um, long-term care, and the one on Kennedy uh, Road, Kennedy Lodge as well. We built two long-term care homes Spons. right in your riding. But guess what you did? You voted against it. You vote against everything for the people of Scarborough. You voted against our housing bill. You voted. Thank you. Thank you. The Premier will take a seat. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The Premier will take his seat. Order. Order. Two reminders. The first one being members should make their comments through the chair. Secondly, when the speaker stands, whoever has the floor should sit down. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. All Ontarians deserve access to a justice system that is easy to access, efficient and fair. However, Ontario's justice system is difficult for some to access due to barriers such as inclusivity, equity and affordability of legal services. These are all important issues that need to be addressed in order for Ontario's justice system to be effective. Speaker, this week marks the start of Access to Justice Week across Canada. This is an opportunity to explore how this sector can be improved and updated. Speaker, can the Attorney General please Question. explain the significance of Access to Justice Week and how its goal promote an effective justice system for all? To reply, the Attorney General. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my friend from Richmond Hill for the for the question, and I'd be happy to explain what Access to Justice Week means, both for for this government and for my ministry. It's occurring across Canada uh, all throughout this week, and it involves government and stakeholders reviewing and working together important changes across Canada and within our provincial justice system. This year is going to be the eighth annual Access to Justice Week, and with participants examining a variety of different issues across our system. But right here, we're building a justice sector that is modern and works for people, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of the Premier, we've seen transformational investments and improvements to our system, greatly increasing access to justice. We are investing in people, processes, technology, and capital. I'll have more to say in my supplementary, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Attorney General. It is great to hear that our government is committed to making continual improvements to Ontario's justice system. However, I hear from constituents that due to the previous Liberal government's neglect of our justice system, they have encountered inconvenient and confusing procedures that deal with our courts. Speakers. Ontarians benefit from a convenient and efficient court system that supports them in addressing their legal matters. That is why our government must focus on replacing procedures that are slow, outdated and ineffective. Speaker, can the Inter Attorney General please explain how our government is transforming and modernizing access to the justice system? Question. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to outline some of the initiatives and funding and, and changes that we're making. We provided funding to legal aid to ensure that there was continued access to justice for those who need it. And in 2020, we updated the Legal Services uh, Legal Aid Services Act for the first time in 30 years, Mr. Speaker. In August, we announced the generational online transformation of our justice system, a $166 million investment that will drive the court's digital transformation, centralizing and improving access to court information and documents for everybody, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to tribunals, we've seen millions of dollars in investments in in people and staff and processes and systems that were left to rot under the previous administration, Mr. Speaker, we've had to replace them. And this builds on our previous work of Justice Accelerated, which saw generational change to our justice system through technology and updating outdated rules. Mr. Speaker, Response. you can no longer serve documents by telegram. You can do them by email, Mr. Speaker. And if you think that's funny, it is kind of funny, but it's very sad. That's what was left to us in 2018, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Elaine, a senior, has been living in her rent control department at 220 Lake Promenade for decades. She will soon be evicted because her building is slated for demolition, even though it is in good repair. Tenants are being unnecessarily displaced, and new buildings will not be under rent control because this Conservative government removed it. These demolitions of perfectly good apartments is making the housing crisis worse because it's removing rent-controlled units from the housing stock. Will the Premier protect tenants like Elaine by bringing back rent control for all tenants? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, look, one of the problems that we're having across the province of Ontario is a lack of supply, and that's a lack of supply that has been brought on by historic obstacles put in the way by the Liberals and the NDP. Right? They say that they want to help tenants. Yet every bill that we brought in here to protect tenants further, to give them more rights, they have literally stood in their place and voted against. Order. They want to increase taxes on those who want to build affordable homes. It is part of their plan. So I say to the member very sincerely, if you want to help tenants, help us build more homes. We are at this year alone, the first half of this year, a 40 four percent increase over last year in purpose-built rentals across the province of Ontario. We are at a 30-year high, Mr. Speaker, but more needs to be done. More needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. You cannot unravel the mess Response. that they left this province in. in. In five years, we're seeing that, right? And it's going to take us longer, but if they would help us, we could move even quicker, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question, member for Toronto St. Paul. Speaker to the Premier, Wanda is a senior living at 55 Brownlow with her daughter and granddaughter. As we speak, her and their neighbours are facing demoviction. 
They're being told that the city must rush through approving their dem eviction because if they fight it, the Ontario Land Tribunal will leave them with nothing. Planners are telling tenants they need to take away their homes today so that this government's tribunal, once stacked with their buddies, I might add, doesn't take away their housing tomorrow, all while giving Wanda and her family nowhere else to go. My question is to the Premier. Will you repeal Bill 23? Will you stop dem evictions? Will you bring back rent control? Where is Wanda? Where is her family? Where are neighbours and tenants across Ontario supposed to go? Will he speak to them? Will the Premier of Ontario speak to the tenants in our gallery today and let them know that their right to housing is a human right that they will respect? Thank you. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, it is one thing to rise in your place and scream and holler. It is another thing entirely. Order. It is another thing entirely to actually do the work that is needed to bring more housing for the people of the province of Ontario. Speaker, this is a member who has Order. voted literally against the very same people that today Order. she is suggesting that she wants to support. When we have brought more measures in to protect tenants, yes. that member rose in her place and voted Charles against. St. Paul's come to order. When we have reduced taxes so that more purpose-built rentals can be built, that member voted against it. When the Minister of Finance brought in a bill and forced forced the the federal government to remove the HST and PST on, on purpose-built rentals, they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. You know what is causing the problems across the province of Ontario? Fonts. Fifteen years of attitudes like that that put obstacles in the way of the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is what caused the problem. Order. The next question. The member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. As 2023 uh, Small Business Month continues, thousands of entrepreneurs across this province and in my own riding are looking to our government for the resources they need to launch a successful small business. There are many ways to earn a living in Ontario, but entrepreneurship will always be among the top. So owning your own business gives you independence as well as an opportunity to provide jobs for others in your community. That said, starting and growing is hard work. That's why it's important that our government continues to make critical investments that will support small businesses across Ontario. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share how our government is supporting Ontarians to successfully launch their own small business? business. The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. I really want to thank the member from Thornhill for the great question. Speaker, during Small Business Week, I visited many great small businesses across our province together with our great caucus. And I want to talk about one specific business in Aurelia that I visited alongside the Premier and the member from Simcoe North. Led Better Foods launched a butcher store in 1926 on Main Street in Markham. Through their hard work and determination, the Ledbetter family was able to grow that small business and have expanded their operations into processing and distribution. They now have two large facilities in Aurelia and are continuing to provide good food and good jobs right here in Ontario. The Ledbetter family's journey and success is a testament to what small businesses can do in this great province. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to make record investments, help create the stable economic conditions needed for more Ontarians to start, operate and grow a successful small business right here in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that great response. And it's really great to hear about local success stories like this one, the one that the Associate Minister shared. The previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, gave up on small businesses. They uh, watched as both businesses and jobs flee the province. Their agenda was higher taxes and more red tape, but under the leadership of the Premier, Ontario is once again open for business. Speaker. Can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is creating the conditions for small business owners to thrive once again? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Because of the leadership of this Premier, we've worked tirelessly to lower taxes, reduce electricity costs, and cut red tape. This 
has resulted in an estimated $8 billion in cost savings and support for Ontario's employers, Water. with $3.6 billion of that going savings and impacting our small businesses. Speaker, what would be beneficial is if the NDP understood that the job of this legislator is not to unequivocally oppose everything that this government is doing, especially when it comes to supporting our small businesses Order. in their constituencies. But unlike them, Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to ensure that more entrepreneurs can enjoy the same Response. success the Ledbetter family has and make certain Ontario remains the best place to live, work, raise a family and own a business. Thank you. Question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much. My question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, in April 2022, this government announced that it would finally be investing direct funding for home care. This money was supposed to go directly to improve access and quality home care because it was a mess. Quality home care should actually be a shared goal for all of us. It means more than one bath a week, for sure. However, in filing an FOI request, Seniors for Social Action Ontario has learned that at least seven of the provincial home and community care support services have returned millions of dollars to the Ministry of Health as of March 31, 2022. Speaker, when our seniors are crying out for better care, and some have become so despondent that they are contemplating medically assisted in dying because that seems like the only option for them. These caring agencies didn't want to send this money back. They Question. know what the need is, Speaker. Can the Minister of Health explain why millions of dollars are being returned to the ministry when the need for home care in Ontario is so great? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. You know, on one point we will agree, and that is the need for home and community care continues to increase, and we will continue to invest. Of course, in our most recent budget, a billion dollars in home and community care that first stabilize the health human resources that are working in the field, but more importantly, actually allow us to make sure that there is consistency in what we are providing to our patients, to individuals across Ontario in a very stable manner. We've been able to do this and, and frankly, I asked the member opposite why yesterday when we were improving and bringing forward legislation that would actually stabilize home and community care, the member opposite and the NDP party voted against it. We voted against Bill 135, uh, Speaker, because it's actually going to complicate an already chaotic system, and people in this province deserve so much better. Right. Speaker, almost $78 million of home care funding was returned to the Ministry of Health. That's $3.8 million from Toronto Central, $24.3 from uh, Champlain, $5.5 million from Waterloo Wellington. That's a lot of money that is needed in those systems. A constituent of mine says that she was appalled to learn that the funds were not invested after she spent years as a primary caregiver to her husband. She witnessed firsthand the lack of stable care, the different people coming to bathe and dress him. This caused great hardship for that family, and she is only one person that would have benefited from this $5 million. So, Speaker, to the Minister of Health, will the government return the $78 million plus any additional funds as yet unreported by other offices and truly invest in stable funding and fair wages so that people in Ontario can age in place with some dignity? Minister of Health. Speaker, it sounds like the member opposite in the NDP party are saying that we shouldn't stabilize home and community care wages. It sounds like the member opposite is suggesting that there is no opportunity for improvement in the home and community care sector. It sounds like, frankly, the member opposite and the NDP are satisfied with the status quo. We are not. We will move forward. We have a plan, and it's working. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition has a point of order. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, in this place uh, some CJPAC interns who are visiting us today, Bayless Saltzman, Jonathan Alter, and staff member Rabbi Jennifer Gorman, who are visiting the legislature. Welcome to your house. Thank you. Technically not a point of order, but we welcome them. Member for Guelph has a point of order.
Mr. Speaker, um, I need to correct my record from yesterday in question period. I, I made a mistake, I will admit. Uh, I did make a mistake. In the excitement around my possible name change, I mistakenly said the government took $1.5 billion away from municipalities, and I should have said $5.1 billion, Speaker, and I'd like to correct my record. You're allowed to correct your record. Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Point Big mistake, buddy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to welcome a special visitor uh, on behalf of the member of Nepean. Uh, Vincenzo Cala is uh, from uh, MPP McLeod's office. He is the uh, social uh, media manager, so I'd like to welcome him to, to the House. Thanks. Technically not a point of order, but we welcome him to the House. Yes. Point of order, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to welcome our honored guests from Vietnam who have arrived during the question period. Please join me to welcome Ambassador from Vietnam, Mr. H. E. Pham Quyen Hien, his lovely wife, Madam Joint Thai Kuket Nang, head of Vietnam at, uh, Vietnam Trade Office in Canada, Commercial Counselor, Mrs. Quyen Trinh. Ambassador Secretary Mr. Dial Nikon, and joining them are Yvonne Cham, President from ACCE, as well as Karen, Execu Karen A, Executive Director, ACCE. Welcome to Queen's Park. Technically not a point of order, but we welcome them to Queen's Park. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I move that the House observe a moment of silence for the four victims of the unspeakable tragedy uh, in Sault Ste. Marie yesterday. Minister of You need to seek unanimous consent to move a motion. Unanimous consent, Mr. Speaker, uh, that the House uh, observe a moment of silence for the four victims of the unspeakable tragedy in Sault Ste. Marie yesterday. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services is seeking the unanimous consent of the House for a moment of silence in memory of the children who have lost their lives in Sault Ste. Marie. Agreed? Agreed. Members will please rise. Thank you. Members may take their seats. Next, we have a deferred vote on private members' notice of motion number 65. Calling the members, this is a five-minute bell. <laughs> 